to order our Greater Albany Public School District Board of Directors meeting for August 3rd, 2020 at 7.02 p.m. If you will all join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for that. And we are going to go into our first order of business is uh, board business. And we just wanted to mention the possibility of having a fall uh, retreat. I believe we have our scheduled training in September 21st, I believe it's, yes, uh, for equity training. But did we want to go ahead and still plan a day for a fall retreat and discussing some of the things previously on our agenda, um, like our strategic plan updates and some of those types of things? Go ahead, Superintendent Goff. Um, yes, yeah, so I would I would recommend that we um, we look at September and October dates to do that if if possible. And with strategic planning in particular, I think we're at a place right now where uh, it makes sense for us to begin moving the moving forward on those um, commitments that we made last year that have been inter Interrupted by COVID-19 and our necessary response to that. And so I would appreciate the board being able to find some time for that work, even if it isn't until October, given that uh, September may be a, a little bit different than typical as well. So, oh, sorry, this is this Jen. <laughs> um, so we've also gone used our fall retreats to um, go over our board goals for the year and to assess, um, you know, where we where we got to or where we didn't in the in the year be um, in the year previous. Um, I tend to think that I have felt like our, our retreats in the past have been time well spent and would be supportive of another. Um, but again, agree that September, well, we've already got the one training in September, so maybe we're really looking at October. Other director thoughts? Should we go ahead and just ask maybe Chris to look for some dates in October, then it sounds like, um, since we do have three weeks in a row of some sort of sessions in September. Um, and that's coming off of also having the graduations and things all the end of August. So maybe we can find some time in October. So we'll ask Chris to look for some times or maybe send out a, um, a survey for times it'll work for us. Thank you. <laughs> all right. And then our second uh, piece of board business was the superintendent evaluation planning. And as you all know, uh, Director Ward did a phenomenal job last year of leading our first kind of full effort at, at getting a 360 degree superintendent evaluation. <clears throat> and it was at a time that we had a brand new um, uh, superintendent Goff was here, not a full year, I don't believe even at that time. So even though we did a 360 evaluation, um, it was for a very shortened period of time. And we do have an obligation to look at uh, redoing that again this year. And so um, I chatted a little bit with Director Ward about uh, trying to discuss a little bit about what the process was she went through, but I think what we need to do as a board is just identify uh, who might spearhead that, uh, if that will continue to be Director Ward or if there's other interest and uh, maybe setting a little bit of a timeline. So Director Ward, you wanna share what you've done so far and then we can look at that. I mean, just reaching out. Right, um, yeah. Uh not not a lot to report. I guess I, I would say if it pleases the board, I'm I'm happy to continue to to spearhead that that effort. 
Um, and I guess the first thing that I would do is uh, reach out to um, the consultant that helped us last year and, um, you know, get some preliminary advice um, from her. It is true that we did a 360 last year. It is true that the board is responsible for evaluating the superintendent every year. Um, however, it is not necessary that that evaluation be a 360 every year. It's certainly a, a discussion that, that we can have as we undertake this process. Uh, my initial kind of feel is that, um, is, is that there would not be a, a need to, um, to, to go to, to that length of undertaking um, on an annual basis, especially not this year following up having done one, but we can certainly have that conversation as we get into it. So if everyone agrees, it sounds like Director Ward is willing to take that on. Does anyone have a burning desire to take that away from her? <laughs> Say no. Um, so the only other thing would be is is discussion about this relevant to have at maybe our retreat time frame, or is that too late in the process? for maybe discussion about what you learn from our consultant and then also any questions we have or things that we want to start considering going forward from there. Why don't I just see if I can make contact um, with with Krista and just kind of get those those broad strokes and, and then see um, where we should start tackling that. I mean, probably this fall is not too, it's not too soon. Um, yeah. But, but I'll, I'll get a better feel from her and try to do that as soon as possible so that we can start figuring it into our fall plans. Great. And anytime you have something you need us to add to our meeting plans, let us know. I certainly will. Real quick, just roundabout, anybody have any comments or questions on this particular item? Yes, Director Eastman. If, if you need any help, just give me a yell. I'll be glad to assist if you need any. I know Michael does have time as well, so. Appreciate that, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Okay, seeing nothing else, we'll move on to Superintendent Goff with the superintendent updates. Thank you, Chair Butzner and board members. And I just wish to express my appreciation for uh, Director Eastman's uh, a volunteer volunteering another volunteer for a job is is fun to hear. So um, <laughs> I, I noted that the humor that with which Director Thompson accepted that. Um, so for the superintendent's update tonight, I think the most relevant update will really be seen down in I-2. And um, as is true with everything that uh, I've been able to report to you, um, things have been changing um, daily, certainly weekly, certainly daily. And um, as you know from today, if I had a conversation with you earlier, that hourly things have changed as well. So um, I did highlight for you on this month's report some of the meetings that I've been engaged in, uh, including um, uh, meetings that we've had with our parents. We have a staff meeting coming up this week on Wednesday. So uh, Assistant Superintendent Harlan and I will be meeting with staff Wednesday and I'm really looking forward to that again. Um, I wanted to, speaking of staff, shout out, uh, have a shout out go to all of our administrators and our office managers who have now returned. Uh, well, when you say returned, uh, most didn't really ever leave because the uniqueness of this uh, of the circumstances in which we find ourselves has led to the need for them to be working throughout the summer and um, people have been very uh, uh, generous with their time and uh, and have made a tremendous difference for how uh, staff and eventually students will be walking back into the door. So I appreciate that very much. And it's glad to, I'm happy to have people back, even if it is just through virtual meetings. Um, we did have an opportunity, uh, Assistant Superintendent Har Harlan and I today to see the elementary principals. They were socially distanced and all wearing face masks at um, Oak Grove this morning in the 
um, main uh, eating space and then also later outside, which uh, turns out is a pretty uh, great learning space for adults. And we're excited to um, to see how we adapt and adjust for students in that space as well. Uh, we have been trying to keep up with questions from parents regarding reopening. And um, one of the things we are reminding our parents about really regularly, sent another message today to parents, is to please get their student or students registered in the Registrar program. That needs to be done by August 11th. And we are sending reminders both from the district level, but then also for, at, from the school level to ensure that we really know where students are intending to uh, head once school begins again in person. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later in today's agenda. Um, and then finally, we continue to work on after school child care programs with um, our community partners. Um, and uh, again, I'll mention this later as well, but we continue uh, to be in a child care crisis. I uh, will share that I have spoken with um, Commissioner Nyquist. Um, I've spoken with the Albany City, I've spoken with the uh, Albany City Manager. I've talked to um, to Janet Steele from the Chamber, all in different conversations, not in one collective conversation. Uh, talked to the heads of the of CAP, YMCA, and Boys and Girls Club. And uh, what is clear to me is that the emergency uh, management services across the state have not seen, and I think we all collectively missed it, and I'll put myself into that as well, has not seen the very real crisis that uh, a lack of childcare is creating for our families um, who are making the very serious decision about um, returning to work and um, as they return to work, um, where what are their options for childcare for their children and uh, what safety precautions are those childcare facilities able to, to make and are they leaving their, um, their children with uh, Less than ideal in less than ideal situations, if they had the if they had the option to be home with them instead, and uh, I think that as I've said to you before, it's certainly not an issue that the school district can solve by itself, nor any nor any single organization in the community or in any community can solve by themselves. Um, but I do believe that. Uh, this is a statewide crisis uh, in talking to my peers across the state. We are in agreement on this on this matter and what we really need are emergency management um, services personnel to lead a task force around um, our different communities to really um, take this on as we would with any other emergency service provision that we that we would have in place during any other crisis. So uh, it looks very different than a hurricane or a tornado, but the net effect is the same. So um, I will close with that and thank you for your time. Thank you for that update. I know we will hear more from you later. So we will look at board reports. Were there any board liaison reports? I think most of our things probably have not been continuing too much, but Director Ward. Oh, sorry. It wasn't related necessarily to a board liaison assignment. I was just going to, and I think Director Eastman was there as well. We were able to attend the um, forum with the TAGS um, families Wednesday night. And I know there was one with the special ed um, families Wednesday night as well. Um, hats off to Lisa and to Melissa. That had been a marathon day, and the tag forum was the very last. I hope, I really hope, it was the last thing on your schedules that day. And and the the questions were just you know coming, and they were they were just spot on. And I just um, I mean, it was it was evident to me from that forum that. They were so grateful. Those families were just so grateful to to have a venue to ask their questions and share their concerns. Um, I I expect the the families that participated in the forum earlier um, felt the same way, and I'm just really appreciative um, to you both for for holding those, um, especially at the at the end of what were already long days. But I I think it was time very well spent. Yeah. Thank you. Were there any other board member comments or community activities? Nope. All right. 
Uh, and we don't have any uh, presentations for the evening, so that brings us to comments from the public. As a reminder, while we are uh, remotely having our meetings, we receive comments from the public up until noon on the day of the meetings, uh, so we have time to get those sent out and prepared. Uh, to be read, and we will have Vice Chair Thompson go ahead and read. I believe we have one uh, public comment yes. this evening. Uh, we have one from a Caitlin Thompson, uh, 3451 Trinity Street, Northeast Salem, Oregon. Members of the board, my name is Caitlin Thompson. I'm a teacher at Lafayette Elementary School. I love my job and the students I work with. There's nothing I love more than being in my classroom in the fall with a new set of students, teaching them and watching them to learn and grow. That is something that all teachers want. However, the reality is that it's not yet safe to return to the classroom. I am high risk, and so I have requested to teach virtually, though this was a very difficult decision. I know for many families, virtual learning is not ideal. Actually, if you had asked me at the beginning of 2020, my stance on online or virtual schools, I would have been strongly against them. I think kids do need the socialization that school gives and that many students learn better in person, but we are not living in normal times. We are living through a pandemic. If students return to in-person instruction, they will not receive the same opportunities to socialize and even more, they will be at risk of exposure to a serious illness. The news is all over the place about the likelihood of students contracting and spreading COVID. And I'll admit, I do not have all the facts, but I do know that even the slightest risk to students or staff well-being isn't worth it. Now I know we have given staff and families options, but just because they have the choice doesn't mean we should put them in harm's way. Virtual learning is not ideal, but I can guarantee our GAP staff will rise to the occasion and deliver rigorous, differentiated, quality instruction to each student. Please protect our community and choose comprehensive distance learning for all until we have had no new cases for 14 days. Thank you for reading our comments for the evening. Uh, moving into our consent agenda, we have the personnel and I believe there was an update sent out late this afternoon and then minutes from the July 13th board meeting. Were there any <clears throat> discussion or any comments, questions, anything there? Excellent, so looks like our consent items are approved. And moving into old business, we are going into policy update for JBB, which is our educational equity policy. And it looks like Superintendent Goff and Vice Chair Thompson will take this one. So I think what I will do is uh, hand this over to Vice Chair Thompson to uh, share the updates and uh, I'm happy to jump in with you as is I'm sure um, uh, uh, Ms. Harlan and Ms. Ward, uh, board member Ward, but um, I will also share my screen so that folks can see the policy um, as we are discussing it. Yes, um, we had a discussion um, with a group, a, a concerned group of actually, uh, I think three out of the five were former um, former Albany students, uh, mm -hmm. and they brought some issues related to gender and sexual orientation um, to clarify within the policy. And basically, the, the additions or changes we we um, added a more uh, up to date citation in the legal uh, in the ORS um, that that was a new new thing for us. <laughs> Um, added the phrase uh, gender identity in a couple places, added gender uh, in a couple places. Um, Not the most recent. We also had a discussion around that was brought up by uh, Director Aganaga the first time, the concept of uh, the phrase socioeconomic versus poverty. We went ahead um, after some discussion to, to include that, make that change. 
basically where it, where it had said poverty. Um, and, and those are the, the main, the main question, main, uh, issues. I think, I think the phrase civil equity was something that they, um, suggested and we had a good conversation about, you know, that's really, they were trying to emphasize in the policy, um, the idea of a, uh, a sense of belonging at the school and a sense of equal opportunity to uh, not just school time, but extracurricular activities. And so they wanted to, um, they thought that phrase uh, spells that out pretty clearly. And we agreed. So, so those, I mean, that, that, those are the changes or the updates to the, to the policy. And my apologies. I was sharing what was in your board packet with that had some missing updates in it, including, um, the gender identity. So you'll see where it says um, sex in the former version that's within your packets and probably was was originally published online. Um, and we've replaced that with gender identity. And then the rest, um, I think that uh, Vice Chair Thompson was able to speak to each of those pieces. So is there any additional I'm going to look for just a show of hands or mics to come off if anyone has any additional questions or comments about this policy. It's coming up under old business. Okay. Uh, um, yes, Director Ward. Well, I was just going to, I don't have any questions. Um, I felt really privileged to be able to work with um, Director Thompson and, and our administrators on, um, on this. And just, I'm really grateful to, it's been really rewarding to have the the input from community members, both um, the the parents that um, kind of kicked this off for us, and with the inter um, intersectional youth that we that we met with, and um, it just really appreciate that the the interest that that the people are following us and supporting us in this work and engaging with us in this work and um, helping. Uh, and I'll just speak for myself, but helping fill in my understanding and helping us um, have an, an end product that is that is better than than what we that we started with. And um, just it, it's been a great experience, and I'm just really appreciative of everybody who engaged in it with us. Thank you, and I think that's echoed probably by all of the board members as we're all nodding our heads in agreement. Great. Yes. <laughs> And uh, thank you to Director Thompson for kind of leading that uh, group with our board members. So, all right. So we will entertain a motion for approval. Well, I'll move that we approve policy JBB educational equity as presented to you. Thank you. So the motion on the table is to approve policy JBB as presented, and we do have it available in both English and Spanish. Uh, I will go around the room here. Director Ward. Aye. Director Eastman. Aye. Director Aganaga. Aye. Vice Chair Thompson. Aye. And I am aye as well, so that passes with unanimous consent. Uh, let's see. And then we are moving into our in-person learning uh, with Superintendent Goff. Thank you so much, Chair Butzner. And uh, so I am going to share with you tonight, uh, I'm going to start us off with a PowerPoint that I will walk you through. And I'm going to ask that you please hold your questions until the end. Hopefully I will move, but I can, I will be able to flip back to slides that you might want to see later. So um, maybe just put the first couple words that are on the slide <laughs> to, uh, to help you remember which slides you want me to flip back to. That would be helpful. And um, I did ask um, nurse Rachel Smith to join us uh, with, and I see that she has, so welcome. And uh, she will be a, a better answerer of many questions than I. Um, so let's go ahead and get started here. Uh, need to. All right. 
So uh, this slide has not changed since uh, I last talked to you about the fall opening. Uh, our primary concern for our students throughout the entire pandemic has been and will continue to be the physical, emotional, and mental health of our students. That continues to be our the, what will drive every decision that I will make for the district operationally. We hope to get students into school for in-person education as much as possible. That is my desire. I believe that our students uh, learn best when they are in classrooms with each other and with the teachers who support them and the education assistants who support them and able to build those relationships. And as we move into fall rather than design for fall, we are placing these priorities at the center and we are looking to the scientists and health specialists from the Oregon Health Authority and the CDC for guidance and for metrics. And you will see that the Department of Education and Oregon Health Authority or OHA have provided us with metrics since we last met. The summer timeline that I introduced to you, I changed it uh, slightly in that I flip-flopped uh, what is in the red in the red zone here on the timeline, and that is that this month we need to submit plans to um, our to Lynn County Health uh, regarding our plans for any in-person instruction, and those plans will also be submitted to you. And I'll give you a little bit of. Uh, uh, caveat to that in a bit. Um, and also on August 7th, not the 11th, I have 7-11 in my head all the time when I do this, so I apologize, but it is August 7th when um, Registar closes and parents need to finalize selection of their student learning model uh, for their student. And so what parents are selecting is which model, once in-person learning begins, which model do they want their student in, enrolled in for at least the first month of that in-person learning. And school still begins in September. Remember last time that we met, we changed the start date for students to September 14th so that staff can have that extra professional learning time to get ready for this new way of teaching and learning with students, but uh, students do start on September 14th. Just, I wanted to uh, share this little slide one more time, a reminder that we have diverse and what seem to be opposing perspectives happening, not only with between, between adults, um, but also within our own uh, experiences. So I myself may fall into many of these circles, um, recognizing that socialization assists mental health, for example, so wanting to get students in person at school as quickly as possible. Um, but then also recognizing that um, children and staff need to be safe and so which takes the greater weight um, and it's certainly I would say that I have been around this circle constantly um, for many weeks now and it seems that as each day progresses I am just spinning uh, around this wheel uh, more rapidly, so the the time around the around the wheel shortens. So I wanted to talk about um, metrics. So on Monday, um, I think Monday or Tuesday last week, Tuesday, one thirty, um, the governor had a press conference where she shared that the. Um, Oregon Department of Education and the Oregon Health Authority have established metrics to determine whether or not um, schools are ready to reopen for in-person learning. These metrics uh, fall into two categories. One is a state category and the other is a county category. The state measures, and I'm going to ask that Nurse Rachel correct me if I am wrong on anything I'm sharing and I've given her um, full ability to interrupt in the moment. So um, please uh, do so if I give any uh, misinformation. But the first measure with the state of Oregon um, is really focused around the test positivity rate. So the state of Oregon is looking at only that um, uh, wanting to have a test positivity rate of less than 5%. So for all of the people who are tested, um, who actually take tests, having fewer, uh, less than 5% of those people test positive for COVID-19. The uh, counties, however, 
are looking both at that test positivity rate and then also at what's called the case rate per 10,000. And this is the first point that I want to emphasize for you because um, the, the um, case rate uh, per 10,000 people has been uh, communicated, and I know you can see multiple things, but has communi been communicated as cases per 10,000, which you can see on this page, which is the Oregon Health Authority COVID-19 uh, county update that is updated every single day. So we can see how our, how our um, county is progressing or not progressing in case counts and in positive tests. So on this page, the Oregon Health Authority talks about case count per 10,000. <clears> when we look at other um, uh, releases of information that we are also receiving from the health authority, we see um, a change in how that's expressed. And instead it's expressed as a case rate per 100,000. So remember the last page was 10,000. This page is 100,000. Now, unfortunately, the numbers that are shared, so for example, here at Oregon, the statewide number of 46.0 is shown as constant regardless of which of the two graphs you look at. Um, so, uh, there has been confusion among superintendents as um, as to whether we are looking at uh, cases per 10,000 or cases per 100,000 people. Um, uh, nurse Rachel did her algebra today because when do you need algebra? Right now during a pandemic. Um, and uh, she was able to confirm multiple times, looking at our data, looking at CDC data, looking at uh, different ways to get there, that the case rate is per 10,000 people. So you may hear in the community, but it's 100,000. Well, that's because our the way the data is getting shared is not consistent in how it's reporting and it's causing confusion among superintendents, certainly, and I'm, I'm sure uh, among board members. Um, all right, so getting back to, to our metrics. So today uh, we received the most recent update from both Lynn Camp or from Oregon Health Authority regarding um, the last four weeks of case rates per 10,000 people. So on for the week of July 5th, in Lynn County, we'll just take Lynn County first, the week of July 5th, we had 19.8 cases per 10,000 people. The following week, we went down to 13.4 cases, which is great. Although remember, the goal is to have a case rate of less than 10 per 10,000. So this is great because we started heading in the correct direction. According to the data that, that is listed in the documents that were shared with us today, Lynn County went back up to 19.8 the week of July 19th and then stayed at 19.8 the week of July 26th. Now, it is unusual in the data to have three out of four weeks with the exact same case rate number. It actually is exceptional. We are the only county that has three out of the four um, weeks that have the exact same number out to the 10th uh, column. So uh, we do have a question. Um, we are asking some questions about the data, but we're going to take the data at base value right now. So 19, whoops, 19.8. So when we look at 19.8, we're getting very close to the number 20. And um, this number of 19.8 is even different than what I spoke to you as board members about earlier today. I spoke to some of you individually in one-on-ones and um, yesterday reported on the Oregon Health Authority site uh, the number that um, was reported was 18.8, which had gone down from 19.2. Hard to explain. Um, today, late in the day, that number went up to 20.1. Um, 
And then when we looked at the weekly reporting done for schools, which is separate than the reporting done um, for the community in general, the number shifted from 20.1 to 19.8. So <clears throat> another um, challenge as we're making informed decisions around what's safe for kids is understanding that the data is uh, consistent and that it's accurate and what it represents. So <clears throat> to put it into um, uh, layman's terms, ideally we would have a number under 10 every single week. Um, where we begin to get concerned is when we approach 20 and start moving above 20 because when we hit 30, that is when we need to move to um, get our schools closed within a week if we have students doing in-person instruction. That if we hit 30 within seven days, we need to um, we need to have, we need to put a plan in place so that um, if we have seven days of 30 or higher, we are, um, we are shutting down the schools. Our concern with our current numbers is uh, that they still remain quite high <clears throat> for Lynn County. Now re remember what we talked about before, which is that Albany, Greater Albany Public Schools is, is a unique community in that we actually um, uh, bridge two counties. So we have both Lynn County metrics to look at and to meet, and then we also have Benton County metrics to look at and to meet. So <clears throat> with both Lynn County and Benton County, our test positivity metrics are, are well below the 5%. Um, however, when we look at Benton County for the case rate, we see 19.1 the week of July 5th, down to 15.9 the week of July 12th, way down to 5.3 the week of July 19th, which is a great improvement, and a huge jump up to 23.3 the week of July 26th, which is the week that just concluded. Um, so these numbers are concerning. Um, the state numbers overall are concerning. We know that in our own counties that we may look different than the state and it's why the state has allowed flexibility around the metrics. Um, if we are able to meet one out of the two metrics and um, it, with consistency and for three full weeks in a row are able to um, have, have passing metrics in the other measures, so in this case, in the case rate, we can ask for an exception for students in kindergarten through third grade to attend school in person. Our concern when we go back to, to balancing uh, student safety and um, student and staff safety, let me say, and uh, instruction, um, we, uh, we find that as those numbers get more out of the targeted metric, we, uh, I become more concerned and uh, much more concerned about safety. So the, um, what we are learning, and this is certainly not unique to Lynn and Benton counties, but what we know and what, what we've known for a long period of time, but what we're seeing play out for us with COVID-19 is that COVID or is that science does not care if you believe in it. Science does not care if you believe in it. So whether you believe in in um, COVID-19 and where your your um, an individual's uh, trust levels may be with where we are in developing a vaccine or what age group may be more susceptible, what we know are three things work to help reduce the spread of COVID-19. Social distancing, face masks, and then hygiene and sanitization. And that was the triangle that I showed you last time that we spoke. Those three things are what will help reduce COVID-19 in our community. And those three things are what are directly related to our ability to provide in-person learning. They are um, not consistently doing those three things and seeing the changes in our numbers, the inconsistency in our numbers um, prevents us from getting back K-12 into in-person learning for our kids. And that is my goal. And um, that is the collective goal. 
And um, anything that we can do to support that, I, I think we need to be paying very close attention to. So as we look at next year, we know that given the metrics that the governor shared, that no students in grades fourth through 12th grade will be allowed anywhere in the state to, um, except perhaps to school districts, but will be allowed to um, attend school um, in person uh, in, on the first day of school um, because the state has to drop below 5%. So I correct myself. The state has to drop below 5% for that to happen. The state is not below 5%. So we don't have an option for fourth through 12th grade students. And remember the state has to drop below 5% for not just a day or a week, but for every day for three weeks. And um, so one day that pops above that starts the clock over again to that three week time period. Um, so we know given that, that our students in grades four through 12 will be starting, um, starting school in a distance learning model. What we also know um, and what I uh, have decided as the superintendent for the school district in weighing the, um, the concerns about safety and health and in recognizing that we want our students, especially our youngest students in classroom for as much in the classroom for as much classroom time as possible, learning how to read, learning how to math problem solve, learning how to build social skills. Um, we want that to be happening as soon as possible. But seeing the data that um, that I have been looking at over and over and over again, um, and seeing again today that data change yet again. Um, I cannot recommend in good conscience that we plan right now for our kinder, first, second, and third grade students to take advantage of that exception and to return to uh, the classroom on September 14th. Um, so at, at this juncture, what, um, what all of our students will be doing, K through 12, is all of them will be starting with a, a distance learning model. All of our students will have um, the option of interactive at-home learning or enrolling in Albany Online. Those are the two programs that um, students can choose from. I, I share this though, wanting to emphasize to all of you and to the community as well. I, I already emphasized, um, and I'll, I'll repeat it again in a minute, the, the concerns that I have about young people being at home um, uh, and in situations where uh, it puts their parents into a very difficult, uh, very difficult situation as to whether or not to go to work uh, in whose care to place the the children and what safety precautions may or may not be in those care providers spaces. And we, and with my deepest respect to care providers who are working extremely hard to make everything work. Um, and I absolutely need and recognize your partnership. We want to be a part of that solution for parents so that we can relieve some of the pressure for our community partners. And right now, um, I don't, believe that we can be a part of that solution because the risk becomes too great for health and wellness. So right now, from today, moving forward, today's the first key date. We need community-wide across everywhere where uh, Greater Albany Public Schools is your attendance address. We need all of you engaged in COVID-19 mitigation work. We need all three of those pieces happening. We need face masks, we need social distancing, <clears throat> and we need hand washing and sanitization to be happening regularly. Um, on August 31st, we will check in on a three week metric, the three week trend that we were talking about to see if we will have been able to meet the expectations for all seven days, three weeks in a row, um, having brought those numbers down consistently below 20, and of course, maintaining that positivity per percentage below 5%. So, and we need to do both of those things for three weeks solid for us, for me, to consider us um, uh, 
uh, providing an opportunity for our K through three students to return to in-person learning in any time in advance of their fourth through 12th grade uh, peers. The first day of school for all students still is September 14th. So every single student still starts school on September 14th. They'll start their learning on that day. But the first day of in-person person learning options for students, for all students, will not be until October 19th. So the first day of school will be September 14th and the first day for in-person learning options will not be until October 19th. And then I spoke to, to this issue around childcare. I don't think I need to, to speak to that again, but uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to, um, to share this information with you. And now uh, board members, I would welcome any questions that you have and uh, please feel free to direct me to go back to former slides. Really quickly before I go around, can you just clarify, <clears throat> I want to be clear on the October 19th date, um, that is still at a restricted level and will be the only, um, October 19th is the first option we would have to go to in-person learning, but we would still have to be meeting any requirements at that time. So it's not a guaranteed start in-person learning on that date. Correct. Everything kind of builds on each other. I thank you. I appreciate you pointing that out. So the COVID mitigation work um, and then building that builds into meeting our metrics for three weeks in a row at any time, even after school, after we have students back. So even after October 19th, we're still looking at those metrics. And if we slide backwards, mm -hmm. then we'll go back to, to distance learning again. So it's very important to pay attention to that, um, that piece. It's still really important uh, for our parents to choose a model in Registrar. Right? That's the one um, piece I wanted to circle back around to. Um, once we return to in-person learning, we need to have in place all of the schedules that we need for your students so that they can start in the in-person format if that is what you choose for them to be engaged in immediately on October 19th. And to do that, we need you to fill out in Registrar. We need you to register for your preferred format um, for that first, mo first month of in-person learning, regardless of when the in-person learning begins. And I just want to start by thanking you for putting all this information together. And I know that your work and um, the rest of the district staff, uh, it's taken a lot, a lot of time and effort. It's a lot of evaluation. Um, and we appreciate uh, all of the time and effort that has gone into this. And I think we all agree that none of us want to have to be making any of these decisions, uh, but we are making them based on requirements that we have. We are not necessarily dictating uh, what we can or can't do. Uh, we're just doing the best we can with what we're being given as far as requirements. And uh, I think you've done a great job outlining all of that information for us uh, as we move forward. And I do think there's something to be said for that, trying to make decisions also so that we aren't, so that families and students can start to plan and prepare for what to expect without having to bounce back and forth. Mm -hmm. At some point, we have to make that decision and not have it be a situation where we're going to be in classroom and then we have to pull back and then we're going to go back in the classrooms and we're going to pull back because I think that will be even worse <laughs> having a back and forth um, from a management perspective, a teaching perspective, and for the students that are trying to learn. So uh, it's, it's a very challenging uh, ordeal that we're having to undertake and I appreciate everyone's work on that. So going around to our directors, uh, do, do we have questions or comments? And I'm just going to go with who I see in the photos first. So Vice Chair Thompson, do you have additional questions or comments? No? How about Director Aganaga? I just want to remind everyone, <clears throat> I talked with the superintendent this morning, and our, our staff wants kids in school. They, they need their kids in school. Uh, all of our staff works in a school because they love kids and they love to educate. Um, we're not doing this to punish anyone. We're doing this to protect uh, the kids that we that we serve. Um, so 
things will get better, but it's just going to be very rough. And thank you, Superintendent and Miss Harlan, for just really working hard. I appreciate it. Thank you. Director Easton. Just to, just to <laughs> um, reinforce what's already been said, given the parameters and given what we've got to work with, we've seen in other states what has happened when, when things get rushed. And very profound statement, the science doesn't care, the virus doesn't care of who we are, what we do, or anything like that. It's going to do what it's going to do. And if we play into that and give it more fuel, potential is is not going to be good. Um, so I, I agree with everything that's been said. And again, thank you, Superintendent and Assistant Superintendent. You guys have done a wonderful job. And um, but the fact of the matter is, if if we create a petri dish, we shouldn't expect anything but uh, a, a flourishment in that dish. And um, my grandchildren, uh, I don't believe um, that their health is worth contributing to the uh, the, the experiment. So um, I think it makes very logical sense. It's not good sense, unfortunately, but it is logical sense mm -hmm. that we start out exactly this way. And um, it's, it's not the easiest way. On the other hand, it's not the most difficult way either. There, there are worse uh, positions that we could be in. But I understand completely how difficult this is going to be for parents. And I'm going to do my very best uh, to assist with the Boys and Girls Club, the YMCA, CAP, and everybody else that's got a, a potential to, um, to take on a child and, and watch them uh, while parents are at work. Uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and voice what I said uh, earlier uh, in, a, in a board meeting earlier um, this year that um, I, I would really hope that the business community looks uh, inwardly very, very hard and uh, does their very best to come up with creative um, positions and abilities and um, ways that they can contribute to assisting their employees who are very, very, very valuable. Uh, uh, I know how valuable those employees can be. And to assist them in some way in, uh, in making our community function through this, um, I think it'll be really, really important and uh, for the business community to, to come up with inventive ideas. Uh, I thank um, Commissioner Nyquist for uh, suggesting the, the fairgrounds. I mean, there are a lot of ways, I think, a lot of resources that we have available to us. And um, we should all look very, very deep and, and find ways that we can make this work. And, uh, and hopefully um, uh, around October 19, we'll have a, we'll have a much better uh, foundation to go forward on. We'll have some of the heavy uh, lift uh, done as far as, as uh, the students, where do they go? What, you know, how are they going to be taken care of? And, um, and then hopefully those numbers will be down. And um, I'm hoping that um, in this, um, because the numbers are up is because we've been out um, vacationing and we've been out swimming and we've been out doing things that, um, you know, um, maybe could have been done differently, but done how people think is best for them. Uh, hopefully, those numbers will come down as we go into the fall, and uh, we can have a uh, we can have a, a really good uh, late October and and uh, good start to first part of November. So, I, I support uh, the action and the suggestions of the superintendent. Thank you. Thank you. Director Ward. Well, I think I'll pretty much echo the sentiments that have been expressed already. Um, Superintendent Goff, when you put up the, um, the picture of the wheel with all the circles, 
Um, I know, as I said last week, that our families are are running through those circles as as well, and mm-hmm. and it looks different for every household and every family, and even within families, it looks different for for each child. And I am so. Um, I continue to be grateful and and proud that our district has been able to offer um, different options for our families so that they can um, pick the one that that works best for their family. And even if in person isn't um, isn't recommended right now, I'm really glad that that we are able to provide that when it is safe to do so. Um, on your presentation this evening. I, I appreciate the data, um, even when it says things that I don't like, um, but I am, uh, I suppose, comfort would be the wrong word, but reassured that these are data-driven decisions um, being made within the parameters that the state has given us. Um, I also really appreciate superintendent's invitation to our community to join with us in educating and caring for our children in a way that we've never asked our community to before. And that's in the COVID-19 um, mitigation that we can all participate in, whether we have children or not. And that is in uh, solutions to childcare, which can um, take place with the organizations that have been mentioned already, but also within our um, within our families and, and in the smaller groups within our communities. Um, just hope that our community will will rise, and I think that they that they will. One co- question that I have been asked is just pretty simple about Albany Online. Is there a limit to enrollment for Albany Online? That's a fantastic question, and uh, I'm actually go- going to let Assistant Superintendent Harlan respond. Um, not because I don't know the answer, but because she may have more updated numbers as to what we're seeing in enrollment right now at at Albany Online to give you a general feel for how that's different than in typical falls. So the simple answer to your question is no, um, there is not a cap to enrollment in Albany Online. Right now we have, I think around 250 students enrolled in Albany Online. And what we would essentially be doing is asking um, asking for um, our teachers who would volunteer to teach kind of virtually, completely virtually in that system um, to be able to aid in just the additional enrollment. So um, enrollment is not capped or limited in Albany Online um, and it will um, likely require um, gap staff, some teachers to teach in the virtual environment. But, beyond the infrastructure that we've had for Albany Online before. And is that is that 250 what we have currently enrolled for fall or is that what our normal enrollment numbers have been? Sorry. I a, yeah, nope, that's a great question. Typically, I think it's around about 100, you know, give or take, depending on the time of year. Right now, it's up at around 250 and that's K-12 entirely through the system. And do we know yet how many or what percentage of our students have not yet completed their online registration and registrar? I wish I'd memorized that number, but I have not. Okay. Uh, um, But what I I will say that um, back to talking about the two distance learning options, I do want to make it clear that uh, Greater Albany is unique in having the teacher directed Um, interactive model, being able to make that available. So right now, all students still have the option to be in front of a teacher from your school or from a school elsewhere in the district who's who's used to teaching your grade level in front of you with your peers every day in kind of a learning environment that we are seeing right here in uh, in Google Classroom so that uh, students have the opportunity to talk to each other, to receive feedback in real time from their, from their teachers uh, and have the sort of engagement that is a little bit more similar to, to a classroom, those, though very different as well, granted. Um, and then Albany Online is uh, a really fantastic option for students who uh, may want to move at a different pace, may be more comfortable uh, moving at a little quicker pace or a little slower pace, may not need as much direct interaction with the same quantity of interaction with a teacher, and may not need the quantity of interaction with peers 
either. So those are two very um, different and yet important options for students to have, choices for students to have. And I'm really pleased that uh, we get to offer that uh, as part of GAPS options for our kids. And we, unfortunately, not all of our, all of the school districts are of the appropriate size to be able to adapt and adjust to do that. So it, that option will not disappear when in-person instruction begins. One question I had was in the, with the recommendation right now, um, or a decision that's being made to have everyone be distance learning to start with, um, let's say those students that are selecting when we do go back in person to have the in-person hybrid option, um, but they have to have a different option right now. Is there, is, can they choose either of those two or is their only option, if, if they're selecting the hybrid for future, is their option um, the middle one for the district or can they do Albany online is there so right now we're asking that they actually make a decision right now that they will agree to stick with that first month that that uh, kids are back in person um, and that option may be you know what I think for that first month that kids are back in person I'm actually going to continue to keep my child in the k-12 interactive at home model to just see how that goes um, so we're asking that that happen because we need to build our schedules around uh, what those expectations are. And we can't do that if immediately we have a group of kids a week before that start date decide, oh, gosh, I know we said, but we're going to change. So we actually need that commitment. It's part of the reason we ask for that commitment by um, August 7th. And I did get um, through a, a little bird that um, about a third of our kids have registered so far through Registrar. So we, we have a, a long way to go um, this week. That's this week, August 7th. So long way to go. So I guess I just, and I want to make sure I'm understanding completely. I'm not sure I do. So if you select the hybrid model right now uh, and you say, yes, we're going to do the two days in, you know, my high school student's going to do two days in classroom, three days off. When school starts, they can't do that. So which of the other two, do they have either of the other two options for their online learning or will they only be able to do the district led online learning? So they will only be able to do the district-led online learning. Great question. I'm sorry I didn't catch that fine point on that. But yes, yeah, so if, if they want to enroll in, in Albany Online, they need to do that for a semester and they can't just jump in in the, um, a month in. So yes, thank you. I okay. might not have asked it very well, so thank you for clarifying. <laughs> Were there other... I think we went through all of the directors with an initial... Um, questions, yes, Director Aguinaldo. I would love if the district or Andrew or somebody would make a big chart with like Albany Online, hybrid, distance learning, in class, just because everybody's still getting kind of confused. Uh, Albany options, people are like, oh, I'm going to know it's, yeah. So love to be able to push that out to parents and just show like, here's what, here's what the categories are. And some of them are grayed out right now. I'm really sorry. Well, happily, since you've asked, we actually did send that out last week and are happy to get you um, send it out to you. I know you get tons of email and we're sending a lot to homes right now. So not only are you getting the board email, but you're also getting the home email. So um, I will ask uh, Director Tomsky to ship that out to you so that you can share that with folks. And it's also available on our um, on our website. So and what it is, is a grid comparing um all of those options so that people know kind of what what does the school day look like and uh, how much how much time should we expect for students and etc thank you so much so i understand um and correct me if i'm wrong superintendent goff but that we you would like us to um look at taking a motion in um support of the decision for our, our um, district in the regards of uh, having remote learning for um, the first part of our year through October. 
Is that correct? That's correct. It isn't something that you need to approve or 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 not, but it's certainly something that I would appreciate a, a, a vote on whether the board endorses that as the logical step. So I will, it is not part of our uh, packet, but I will entertain a motion uh, in support of the decision that's been made for our distance learning to start the school year. I move that as a board, we support the, um, the plan that has been presented this evening to uh, begin all grades uh, on September 14th virtually and to um, open up in-person learning as soon as we are, or by October 19th or as soon as we are able to meet the metrics, which may be a little later. So there is a motion on the table. I will try to get all of those things <laughs> we just made in this motion, but um, there's a motion on the table to in, uh, have board members in support of our decision for distance learning for our K through 12 uh, start of the school year. Uh, it will be all distance learning with the hopes that the district will be able to go to an online or in-person option uh, by October 19th or as soon as possible before or after. So, Director Ward. Aye. Director Eastman. Aye. Director Aganaga. Aye. Vice Chair Thompson. Aye. And I also vote aye. Uh, again, uh, that passes unanimously. And on behalf of the board, again, I want to thank our district staff and our superintendent, super, uh, assistant superintendent, and even all the community members that have participated uh, in helping us get through these decisions while they are not all um, the decisions we want to have to make. Uh, we also know it's not our ideal learning situation but we appreciate everyone's support as we move forward and the positive um, support we can provide to our students and our families is going to be our next, you know, big focus as we gear up for fall opening of school. So thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate that. And thank you, Nurse Rachel Smith, for preparing me so well ahead of time that you didn't get one question during the board meeting. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Okay, so we have no board reports for the evening and that will just move us. Uh, oh, you know, it is a little after eight o'clock. So in um, keeping with our tradition, we're going to take about a 10 minute recess uh, so that we can have a break and we will come back at 820 and finish the rest of our agenda.
Looks like we have everyone back. Um, I see Doug is maybe connected as well. Audio, not video, it looks like. There he is. Excellent. Thanks for joining us. All right. Um, so we're going to move into our bond business and reports, and we're starting off with the uh, monthly bond report with Russ and David. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. On page 27 of your packet begins the end of month report. This takes us through pro um, project costs, uh, expenses, etc., through the end of June 2020. David, you want to go ahead and give an overview and then stand for questions? Yes. Uh, so first, uh, we, we are continuing to work on closeout. Uh, you hear me say that month after month after month. Closeout takes this uh, tremendous amount of time. Uh, at Meadow Ridge, we found some mechanical issues here as we were closing out commissioning, and we are working to resolve those. Um, and then we're waiting for the contractor to deliver the final O&M's uh, warranties and has built. At Oak Grove, the router right of way improvements have been made. And uh, uh, we've got a few mechanical issues that we're working there to resolve. Uh, and that should be done shortly. Uh, South Albany High School, uh, we are found some uh, mechanical issues. I think we talked about that last month. Uh, we are continuing to resolve those um, and are continuing to move forward through the closeout phase. Uh, the South Albany fire, uh, we encountered a supply chain delay. We believe that is, uh, uh, has COVID uh, related issues and that was for some hydronic control valves. Those uh, w were delayed. We weren't able to complete on July 15th uh, hopefully be able to complete on August, the week of August 10th. Once that is done, we'll be able to start the commissioning effort. Um, once that work is done, that building is operational. Uh, the commissioning just makes sure that it's tuned properly. Uh, so if we could use the analogy of a car so that all eight cylinders are firing correctly. And so that's what the commissioning process will do. Um, and uh, that is really the last that we'll have to do to wrap up uh, the fire cleanup work. Uh, West Albany continues to make progress. I know this isn't technic. July 1st, we did the tour of the board and the district bond oversight. Please, uh, thank you for coming. Um, uh, that, was, that was really a highlight of last month. If I can say that July 1st was uh, part of June, it feels that way. Uh, continue to make progress, continues working, co contractors working hard in just many different areas of the building to just continue to uh, progress that project. Uh, the contractor has delivered a notification of delay. Uh, we are currently reviewing that. Uh, their, their delay is 67 days. Uh, the difficulty with that is, is they consolidated a number of various issues and so we're trying to part and parcel and work through that with them. Uh, it, it's been a it's been a very collaborative dialogue. Uh, we have not uh, finalized that. We're hoping to have that finalized here in the next couple of weeks. Um, North Albany Middle School. Uh, you may ask, why are we still working on North Albany Middle School? It was a last summer project. And uh, at the end of that project, uh, we had to replace a smoke hatch, which is in the cafeteria. If any of you have looked up at the ceiling near the stage, you'll see this hatch. And uh, what that is for is for the fire department, if there's a fire, to be able to open that up and to help uh, evacuate smoke. Um, so that is being replaced uh, this summer. Um, and should be complete uh, shortly. Uh, the various CFU projects continue to be on track. Um, and uh, one, one I wanted to just point out to you, if you would turn to page 71 in the board packet, I'm not sure if everyone's aware of this, 
Uh, but after we did the parking lot last year, uh, we uh, this realized that there was an opportunity to create a, a new front entrance. So instead of people uh, going through that uh, front entrance that faces, is it, what's the road? Is that out front there, the frontage? Um, is it 24th? 24th, yes, thank you. Uh, what we realized was that there is a tremendous opportunity to be able to create a pathway uh, directly into the building across from the office. That's a, that's a great win for that building because currently from a security perspective, uh, they were having to buzz people in from that entrance on 24th and this way they'll have a better visual cue uh, for people that are coming in the door and then entering the building. And so that's been a, a, a great win for that project and um, really also aligning with uh, some of the goals uh, for safety and security for the bond. Uh, one thing too, if you could go back to page 32, sorry for this flipping back and forth uh, in your board report. Uh, I was thinking uh, recently after, you know, every month coming to you with change orders and having the discussion about change orders and the fact that nobody likes change orders. We don't like change orders. You don't like change orders. Um, but, but they're unfortunately a fact of life. One of the things that I did was I created this summary sheet for you. You hear us talk about a thorough vetting review we do. I wanted to be able to demonstrate to you what we have done uh, because we track all of this regardless. We track this information uh, in logs that we have created. Uh, and so if everyone's there, let me just kind of walk you through it quickly. Uh, so for instance, at Meadow Ridge, there were 210 change orders submitted by the contractor or contractor subcontractors. Uh, only 154 of those were approved. Uh, the submitted change orders was for 2087000 and the final approved was for 1424000 So there was a net savings of about $663,000 to the district. Um, and you can, you can go through, see, I don't want to take the time to go through every one of them, but you see uh, the statistics there for, for those. Uh, you, would, you might say to me, but doesn't every project manager do this? And my experience from talking to other school districts is no, they don't. They don't have a thorough vetting process. And I've got those five bullets there. You know, we, we analyze it through these lenses. Is the requested change actually found in the plans and specifications? You would be surprised how many we find are actually in the plans and specifications that we reject. Uh, is the change order priced according to the process detailed in the contract? So we have we have detailed how they can price the change order, and often we find that they haven't. You know, you know. Here's kind of a a gross example: is is that potentially they are charging 25 or more percent markup, whereas we're only we only allow 12 percent. So um, and, and charging for a sundry of different things. So we are reviewing it for those. Uh, is the pricing reasonable and fair? Um, is there another way to accomplish the requested change that is less expensive? And then has the district received the credits? Often uh, we could be changing from one product to another, but when we change to that other product, the district is really due a credit. And so, you know, those are things that we're looking for. So I felt like it was important for you to see that you know, when we bring change orders to you, we are not just bringing every single one to you. They just don't pass through. There is a thorough process, and here's the statistics for your projects uh, showing uh, the, the process that's been implemented and, and what it has, uh, in essence, saved the district. Um, that, in essence, is my update. Uh, are there any questions? Yes. David, uh, change orders come about, as we all know, in, in 
for multiple and various reasons. Um, and I'm curious, um, what, what might be uh, justification to reject a request from a contractor for work done above and beyond their contract? I mean, what, what might be a, uh, I'm just curious, what, uh, what might reject a requested change order uh, for payment? So a great question, Pat. Uh, so, for instance, uh, there could be, so first of when a contractor bids a project, they bid the whole of the documents. They're responsible for architect, for the architectural, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, structural, and they're re responsible for all the specifications. So one, I'll give you two examples. One is, is that there could be a specification that says that every mechanical unit on a roof needs to have a convenience outlet, and that needs to be on a GFI circuit. But in the drawings, it doesn't show a GFI circuit. Code and the specifications require it. So the contractor says, well, you owe me for putting a GFI plug on every one of those pieces of equipment. And we say, no, we don't, because the specifications state that the GFI circuit is required. And number two, code requires it. You're an electrical contractor, you should have known that. So there, there's one instance. Another instance is, is uh, when, when you're safe, let's just take Meadow Ridge for an example. Uh, when you're framing, doing a wood framing of that building, uh, there are times that the architectural doesn't state everything that the structural does, and the structural doesn't state everything that the architectural does. And, and the contractor, the framing contractor, could begin to frame a wall only looking at the architectural drawings and not looking at the structural drawings. And they could then realize that in that structural drawing, they're supposed to put two posts and a glue lamp beam and then frame the wall but they didn't do that. So they come and say, well, you should have said that on your architectural drawings. No, you bid the whole of the documents and it's standard that you look at the architectural, you look at the structural, and then you build your walls. So that's two examples of, of a time that we would reject a change order uh, because uh, uh, it, it really is in the documents. It may not have been uh, spelled out with a nice bow and ribbon uh, you know, for them, but it is spelled out and they needed to, you know, look at the whole of the documents to then do whatever they were being asked to do. So errors made uh, by a contractor when they should have known better and submittal for payment to make up for that, that does that always uh, necessarily mean that that's a savings to the district? No, no. Um, I, so the, when I was mentioning the credit, there are times when an owner is due a credit. Um, mm -hmm. I wished I had an example right now of, of one of the changes orders that we've had, uh, but uh, there are times where the owners do a credit because we're changing from one way product to another. In that, the, that the owner needs the credit and the credit needs to be part of that change order calculation. No, not every single change order is a credit to the owner. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or comments about the board report? Bond report, excuse me. No? Okay. So we are back to rest for change order approval. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, starting on page 115 of your packet, uh, there's some information with regards to request a change, uh, a request a change order uh, with girding builders in the amount of $90,587. Uh, and just want to note that um, half of that change order is formalizing a previous decision that the board made relative to some safety improvements in front of Oak Grove Elementary. David, um, you wanna go ahead and uh, say anything else with regards to the change orders? Uh, I think you covered it. Okay then, I guess we will stand for questions. 
or sit for questions. Why don't you to refresh our memories in regard to what the expense is for us? Uh, Dave, David, uh, you're probably uh, better to walk through each of the PCAs or PCOs, excuse me. Okay. Uh, so 78 was to um, uh, change uh, the uh, epoxy flooring uh, to a, a, a different product that's uh, on page uh, 117. Uh, as the projects have uh, moved forward, uh, we have found that uh, uh, a different epoxy uh, product is actually better, more durable for the district. And so that's what that change is. Um, 78B uh, is tied to that uh, uh, epoxy flooring. And I can't remember why we split the two out, but it's tied to that epoxy flooring change. I know Doug is on. If if uh, there, you have any additional information, Doug, that you can provide on that, I believe we had two different contractors in there, so the change ended up coming through in two pieces because we had one company right. doing the lower floor and the second company doing the upper that's, floor. That's right. Thank you. One fifteen R one. Um, this, this is one where the folding door, uh, would not close the folding partition would not closed. And so we had to revise, uh, that jam detail for it to close at the stage in the gym. Uh, 118 is to add additional panic hardware. And I, I'm not sure if this was a, uh, uh, a jurisdictional requirement. Uh, it looks like some of it was requested by the district uh, for uh, door access controls, security access controls. Um, 120 was some uh, additional work that uh, Reese and Associates uh, had done on the bus loop. Uh, the bus, the turning radius was too tight and we needed to make some changes to that so that the bus could uh, make the turn. Uh, it, David, it, 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 it talks about it being this, the improvement at Oak Grove Elementary and uh, Oak Grove and Scenic Drive. Oh, you're right. That is the right-of-way improvement. The, the, the sidewalk improvements necessary that the city required at the intersection. Right, right, right. Um, 121R, I'm, I'm not, Doug, do you remember where this one is? Do you have that one open? Yeah, this was actually back up from the soccer field. Um, there was uh, some grading issues That's with right. the, the walking path and the, the water as it was um, trying to get across that, that track. So I believe they added that drainage. That's right. So we, we moved, we added drainage. I believe it was further west in the track so that we didn't have uh, bonding. And we could get across and be able to get the water to then... Uh, flow out down to the creek to the south. I think that's the last one, David. Yes. So are there any other board director questions? Director Eastman, did you? Have no? no, okay. Thank you, David.
So we will entertain a motion on this one. Um, we do need to approve um, or at least have a vote on this. I'd like to make a motion to approve change order 19 to girding builders in the amount of $90,587. So the motion is to approve change order 19 to girding builders in the amount of $90,587. Uh, Director Eastman? Aye. Director Ward? Aye. Director Aganaga? Aye. And Vice Chair Thompson? Aye. And I also will vote aye. Again, a uh, unanimous decision. Uh, and let's see. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, and up next is Superintendent Goff with our uh, LBL Local Service Plan Resolution Amendment. I am navigating between two documents right now. So, um, the uh, service plan resolution amendment outlines how the LBL SEIA plan will support component districts. This plan was developed with district needs assessment data and ongoing conversations with staff in support of both the continuous improvement plan and the student success act plans. And this amendment just covers that plan. Were there any director questions for superintendent? Nothing? So as new business, this one will come back as old business for Correct. next meeting. All right. And under other business, we have the quarterly investment report from Director Allen. Uh, this is information only. I don't have a presentation, but uh, if there are questions, I will certainly jot them down and get answers for the board. Any questions? No? Thank you for sharing that information. You are off the hook for questions. <laughs> um, so at the end of our agenda, I just want to point out the dates of interest for uh, the board members. Uh, August 5th, uh, we have pre-planning, which is Wednesday at eight. A um, little different, and I apologize. I know that's myself, and I can't remember who else is on that one. That direct, uh, Vice Chair Thompson, I think. Okay. Um, and then on the August 17th, our regular school board meeting, and then the 25th, 26th, and 27th, we have uh, the three graduation ceremonies, which at this point we have not gotten any updates for, so plans are still in progress for that as far as we know, yes. I'd actually ask if you could go to to give you an update on that. We meant to do that earlier during the superintendent's report, and I knew I was forgetting something. So Excellent. Right Thank you. So um, what we'll be asking for from the board are um, two school board members for um, the West Albany um, High School graduation, two for the South Albany, and one for the Albany options. The dates and times remain the same. The format will look a little bit different. Um, in that we know that we are limited to um, gatherings of under 100 people um, at this point in the state. And so we will have, um, uh, we're working on plans to have the graduation ceremonies um, at the same location um, with um, some drive up for families um, and a method by which we can have you know, 70 students at a time exit to come sit down a process where they will get their um, diplomas, their rows be recognized. And so um, we'll get written plans out to you, but the dates and times are the same. We will still need board members in attendance trying to limit um, the amount of um, exposure for people, both students and um, school board. And uh, we're excited and hats off to the high school administrators and um, Susie Orsborn, of course, for um, organizing what that um, will look like, but we'll be able to uh, live stream it. I'm hoping to also have it on um, the radio um, and at the Expo Center outside um, so that we can celebrate our graduates because they certainly deserve it um, and they're a special class. And so we're excited to be able to still, um, to still be able to do that. 
Thank you for that uh, update. I did just want to clarify um, whether or not they're still planning on doing uh, speeches and presentations and all of that as well in the past the board members. We've had one speak at each. Uh, are they still planning for those? They will not plan necessarily to have board members speak at each one of them. Um, we'll have some other things, but that won't be necessary this time. Okay, thank you. Um, Director Ward, did you have a? Uh, that was my question. Oh, perfect. And Director mm -hmm. Eastman. So given all the discussion earlier in the evening and, and you know, what school is going to look like, when, when can we expect to have a better idea of um, what we're going to be participating in? So I can give you a good idea now. I'm a little reticent just because I know some of the details could change and this is um, obviously a public meeting, but essentially what will happen is we'll have families in, in their own cars. And if you live in that household who you want with you, um, we will have um, them drive in to the um, expo center. We'll have three screens on flatbeds. Um, and then we'll have groups of students come out. We'll have chairs six feet apart. So the first group of students will come, will sit, their names will be announced. They'll come across the stage. Um, they'll receive their diplomas. Um, Albany Options isn't, um, isn't nearly as difficult or complicated because th the group is smaller. West Albany will likely have probably four groups. We'll do that in groups of four. So some of the benefits of this is that everyone will be able to see everybody else graduate. So, you know, if we were to do smaller groups than that, it would be tough because we would have to do 10 mini sessions essentially, or limit graduates to only have one, two, three tickets for people to come watch them. Um, and so kind of this um, model um, that they're planning and looking at kind of feels like the, uh, the best in this situation in that graduates will be able to have more than two people come watch them graduate. They'll also be able to watch their friends graduate, even if they're not in that same group of 70, and we'll still be able to have kids come physically get out, go across the stage, get their diploma, get a picture taken, um, and uh, participate in the ceremony. So um, those are some of the um, details. And of course, I can give you as many of the details as um, we have right now and it's questions that you have, but that is the plan right now. We'll set up on the, for the first day and that setup will remain the same for all three. Um, and so, obviously is helpful as well. So it sounds like what you need from us is a decision on uh, which two board members for will be available for West uh, or for South Albany, which is on the 25th, the one board member for Albany Options, which is on the 26th, and then two for West, which will be on the 27th. Um, and do you want us to do that tonight or do you want us to do that by email with Chris? Just give her yep. some info. Perfect. Yep, that's absolutely fine. And then Assistant Superintendent Harlan will continue to be working with the high school around what your role will be and where you will, yeah, please, uh, please if you can mute, mute, there you go, um, around what your role will be and where you will physically be during that um, ceremony so that you have questions answered regarding your own personal vulnerability and, and your presence there um, at the graduation ceremony. And so our, our goal is to make, uh, create a safe uh, graduation experience for our students. And there's a lot of details going into the planning. And um, I want to particularly thank Principal Orsborn for coordinating that uh, for the schools. Great. Sounds like we'll have more information coming. And so if um, board members could send um, Chris some information about which ones they're available for preferences or that sort of thing for dates, that would be great. And um, anyway, then we have our September regular um, meetings and then our work session. And then we have actually a bond oversight meeting that is on our schedule for October. So I think with that, we are adjourned for the evening at 8.50 p.m. Woohoo! <laughs> have a good evening, everyone.